Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man who serves up soul rolls and pimping the poultry, ladies and gentlemen, the captain. Yep, I'm spending most of my life living in a gangster's paradise. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today we are still sipping on spats in Oktoberfest by our good friends overseas serving up the traditional Oktoberfest beer. It's that time of year, Captain. I love the fall and I was built nice and sturdy for a good Oktoberfest. And if you want to get authentic or pretty close to it for us here in the States, fill up a glass with spats in Oktoberfest garage grade three and three quarter bottle caps out of five. And let's give a good cheers to our friend Andy from Cincinnati. This cheers is coming from Nick and the captain, but also Jamie. So big shout out to our friends in OHIO. Yeah, don't be an ass. Fill up a glass. A big We Like to Jib goes out to Amy from Virginia. Everyone we mentioned went to our website, truecrimegarage.com. Helped us out with this week's beer fund. And for that, we thank you. Yeah, you want to help out the garage? Go to iTunes and leave us a five-star review. B double E double R U N. That is enough of the business. All right, everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Unfortunately, Amy Baker is no longer with us, and 33 years ago, someone took her life after she ran into car trouble on the side of Interstate 95 way back in 1989. Now, police have been upfront, and investigators have been upfront with the public here, Captain, in telling us, here is what happened. And the reason why they are telling us in this case, and which is a little bizarre, because we've seen in other cases where they tell us nothing about what they know that happened and still ask us for our help, us being the public. The old, we're going to keep the information close to the vest statement. In this case, they're saying, here is what happened, public, now please help us out. And you'll see why they are desperate for information from the public based off of the evidence, what the evidence suggests to them in this case. So police have said repeatedly in the case of Amy Baker that what happened that night was that Amy ran out of gas. She decided to leave her vehicle. She walked, started walking toward the, this gas station that was nearby and someone unknown to her abducted, raped and murdered her along her way, along the way to getting help for her vehicle. We have several reports that will back up this statement from the local law enforcement. The first being from the Richmond Times Dispatch that says, quote, the night of March 29, 1989, Amy Elizabeth Baker was driving south on Interstate 95 when her 1970 Volkswagen broke down, forcing her to pull onto the shoulder just south of State Route 617. 617 exit in Fairfax. Police believe the 18 year old Stafford woman was walking up the exit ramp and had nearly reached the top about 9 15 PM when she was confronted by her assailant. She was then forcibly taken into the nearby woods, sexually assaulted and strangled this again, all according to the police. Another Report that backs this up comes from the Washington Examiner that reports on May 29, 1989, Baker was driving south on Interstate 95 when her car stalled out around 9 p.m. The 18-year-old left her blue 1970 Volkswagen Beetle on the shoulder and started walking toward an Exxon station on nearby Blacklick Road. Police believe someone accosted Baker at the top of the exit ramp and forced her into the woods. Now, note that this time frame, right? The 9 p.m. sighting makes a lot of sense. The police spotted the beetle after 10 p.m. with the hazard lights on. But Amy left her aunt's house around 
820. The distance between Falls Church and Newington is about 20 miles. It should have taken Amy maybe 30 minutes, even with some traffic, to get where her car was found. It seems that if Amy was seen, this is all key to this case, we have an eyewitness now. It seems that if Amy was seen around 9, the timing lines up nearly perfectly. Yeah, and in so many cases that we've covered, the timelines don't line up. So it also means that her car was there for, we could say, quite a while before it was spotted by the trooper around 10. And and the original report says just after 10 p.m. We had a press release that was issued in 2010. Note the years, right? This case takes place in 1989. We have the the police actively asking the public for help in this case. We Yesterday, we cited a 2005 request from law enforcement to the public asking for whoever called Crime Stoppers on April 3rd, 1989 with some information. Please call us back. We are still looking for you. We want to talk to you. We believe you know something that is of great importance to this case and to this investigation. That's 2005. This press release is 2010. So what should be of note and should be a kudos to the police and in in the investigators in this case is that they have actively been working this case all of these years later. So this press release that was issued in 2010 says it's titled 1989 Homicide of Amy Baker. And this is now the cold case investigation that is happening in her case. And the Fairfax County crime solvers had this news release from the cold case investigation in 2010. It says crime solvers seeking information on cold case homicide. Fairfax County crime solvers is seeking is still seeking the public's assistance, identifying the person responsible for a homicide that occurred 21 years ago. About 9 p.m. on Wednesday, March 29, 1989, 18-year-old Amy Baker was driving southbound on Interstate 95 near Blacklick Road when her car experienced difficulties. Amy abandoned her blue 1970 Volkswagen Bug and walked up the exit ramp onto Blacklick Road toward the Exxon gas station. I believe it's called Back Lick Road and not Black Lick Road. Detectives believe that her attacker confronted her and forced her into the woods near the top of the exit ramp where she was sexually assaulted and strangled. Her body, which was found two days later, was partially buried in some leaves. Detectives continue to investigate her death and would like to speak with anyone who may have been in the area at the time of the attack or who may have knowledge of the incident. In addition to the $1,000 cash reward offered by crime solvers, a $26,000 private reward is also being offered for information, which leads to an arrest and indictment in this case. Anyone with information is asked to contact crime solvers by phone at 1-866-411-TIPS which is 8477. You could also email at www.fairfaxcrimesolvers.org or text TIP187, T-I-P-187, plus your message to CRIMES274637. As always, callers never have to give their names or appear in court. Well, a couple of things that I find difficult in this one is that nobody... No eyewitnesses that we know of saw another vehicle, but because this is so close to an exit ramp, I also, I often wonder with this case, did the perpetrator get off the exit, park somewhere, and then walk back on foot? That way they could make, they could commit the crime. They could commit the rape, the murder, and then walk back to their vehicle. I would like a better description of what the officer who spotted these vehicles, remember the vehicles that they were asking the public to call about. So a couple things here, what this tells me is those, even though those are pretty vague descriptions, either that information didn't reach those drivers and they don't know to reach out to police or 
one of those drivers does not want police knowing that they were in the area that night. And so uh, what I'm talking about is that 80s Buick and the um, Ford Escort that police were asking for. I want more of a description by law enforcement of why are these vehicles of importance? Okay, they were in the area is what we're told. What does in the area mean? Were they parked alongside the interstate? Or was one of them seen on Blacklick Road? Or were these just simply vehicles that had happened to pass by uh, around the time? The other thing that's difficult, though, too, Captain, is the vehicles that are in question that the police are asking about information for, those vehicles, we have to keep in mind, were spotted by the state trooper, which would have been after 10 p.m. Her car based off of the timeline that we've gone through, and I know it was a little repetitive for the listeners there, but the reason why we went through multiple reports was to confirm what police have said always has happened in this case, right? That around 9 p.m., her vehicle was already broken down, out of gas, hazards on, she's on foot, and they have a witness. Some kind of witness has told them that she was spotted on foot up near the exit ramp. Right. So she had made it a, at least a short distance before someone accosted her. Those are, are their words. And so they have reason to believe based off of this eyewitness sighting that she made it pretty close to this gas station before the abductor happened upon her. So again, that, Again, this is this is all very weird stuff because I keep going back to how the vehicle was found, and it's found in the unlocked state. the The doors were not locked. Now that could just be simple. It could be something as simple as she intended to lock the doors, but for whatever reason failed to do so. Because the change in her pocket suggests to me her intention was to call for help. And remember, she's only about twenty minutes away from her home. My right. guess here, if I had to try to crawl inside the victim's mind here, would be that her intentions were to call home, ask dad or mom to come and meet her, her or bring her gasoline. Because there's nobody saying that she had a gas can, which which is a little weird to me, too, seeing how this is not the first time that she's run into this problem. But it, all indicators to me are is that, is that she made an effort to lock her her personal belongings in her vehicle flashers on and intended to make a phone call and then be back at her vehicle rather quickly. And this gas station's not terribly far from her car. So, and, and I want to point that out. That's something that I think when we attempt to profile our victim in our victims movements of that night, to me, that is very key because I know there's a lot of people out that out there that are going to say, well, maybe somebody offered her help and she got into somebody's vehicle. That's certainly a possibility, but I would put it at the very low probability based off of two things. One, if I'm an 18-year-old woman and I'm on the side of the road at night and I can see the Exxon station from my broken down vehicle, I ain't getting in nobody's car. I, I'm walking to that gas station. And two, we have... What police tell us are an eyewitness that saw her walking and saw her up near that exit ramp. Right. So here, here becomes another question, though. If you're an 18-year-old female and you're walking and you can see the gas station, you're not going to get in a car of a stranger. That doesn't mean you wouldn't get in a car of somebody you were familiar with. And I also wonder is where the body was found, is that the crime scene? Because if she did get into a vehicle, it's it's very likely that the vehicle became the crime scene and they decided to drop her back off. At this point, they would have access to her keys. And so they could have unlocked the door. They could have been the ones to put on the flashers. Who knows? Yeah, I mean, it's it's difficult to say exactly what happened here, but we do have the statements of police that seem pretty definitive in their statements of her car broke down, ran out of gas, 
she was walking on foot when she was accosted and abducted by somebody unknown to her and taken into the woods where she was assaulted and killed there. Um, again, we don't know exactly what they're basing all that information off of. We do know that there was uh, an eyewitness um, that, that saw her walking, but for them to repeat that statement to the public and then ask the public for help time and time again, it sounds to me like they have reason to be very locked in on that situation. The other thing too is, and and I know I've said this in a, in a previous episode and somebody tried to challenge me on it, but I have reviewed hundreds of cases. I've never, ever recall. And you, sometimes you're playing the probability and you're playing the numbers here when you're trying to profile these things. But I've never reviewed a case where somebody is abducted, sexually assaulted and killed and then returned to the area where they were abducted from. It's it, to me, I, I'm not saying it's never, ever happened in the history of mankind, what I'm saying is out of the hundreds of cases I've reviewed that it's, I've never come across that once. So th that being the situation, I would put that at, at a very, very small probability. Well, obviously technology has changed since 1989, but don't you think because of the sexual assault, because of the rape, because of the strangulation, that we would have some kind of evidence to test now to get this, you know, douchebag to get this murderer off the streets? Well, the answer to that is I have two answers for you. Yes and no. And as, as we will see, we'll get into it. So luckily we have um, some more information that comes by way of the family. And this is really important information to me here, Captain, because it's coming from Mary, who is Amy Baker's aunt, who was with Amy Baker's mother, Sue. Mary's the one that, that first finds the body. And she posted on a Fairfax message board about the case. And I'm going to just read part of her post for the listeners because it was rather lengthy, but here's the important stuff as, as, as the Colonel sees it. So it says, quote, thank you for your concern and compassion about Amy. Her car broke down at nine 30 at night and it was dark outside at the time. It is believed she was walking to the gas station to call someone for help, but never made it that far before being abducted. I had parked my car at the gas station the morning we started searching for her, and you couldn't see the spot where we found her from there. However, since she broke down on Interstate 95, I still find it hard to believe with all of the traffic at that exit that no one saw her with anyone. We know she made it part way to the station before being abducted, and Newington is always a busy interchange. Blacklick, which is the other road, did go across 95 at the time. Remember, we had said that that area has changed a little bit. And we believe she was heading for the gas station on Blacklick near the top of the ramp. The only businesses around that area at that time were the Newington Motel and the Exxon Station. No, the ramp was not icy that night. In fact, it was very warm for a March night, almost like spring. We do know she made it to the top of the ramp and everyone was checked out that worked close to that area that night. She never made it to the Exxon station. If she had, she would have made a phone call for help and a call was never made. She had relatives that drove tow trucks. That's very important. And she would have called them. Not the first time she had broken down, but in a different car. She knew who to call. And then it said, and then just some items from my notes here. Remember that change was found in the pocket of Amy's shorts. We know this based off of the police reports. And we know that her wallet was found in her vehicle. So her aunt is pointing out that the most likely spot or I'm sorry, what her aunt is pointing out is likely spot on. Amy intended to use the payphone at that Exxon station to call for help. 
Yeah, the problem with some of these cases, again, is technology because at this point, you know, today, if somebody makes a call, well, one, they could have a cell phone so they could call you at the side of the road. But let's say she made it to the gas station and made some phone calls. I'm sure there was not everybody in her family that she could have called, pulled their phone records to see if she called. But because of the change, because nobody is is admitting that they heard from her, it's probably more likely, like you said, what they believe, that she never made it to the gas station. She never was able to make a call. Again, I'm putting a lot of weight in the the investigator statements to the public. They're not going to try to mislead us and then ask us for our help. We, you know, as stated, one, we don't have anybody saying that they spoke to, to Amy via phone that night. And you're right, captain. I'm sure that not everyone that's related to her or, um, who she may have attempted to call that the phone records were in fact checked or confirmed that she didn't call them. But we also have the statement that everybody that worked in the area at that time has been interviewed by police. So what I'm getting at is we have zero eyewitnesses that put her at the payphone, zero eyewitnesses that put her at or inside the Exxon gas station. This is a congested area, high traffic area. And I also imagine we don't have a ton of people that she's going to call. It's not a list of 30 people. It sounds like she would have called her home. Right. Or she would have called one of these relatives that owned a tow truck. I'm look, uh, I, I, I know that we live in a different world today than we did in 89 and nobody can remember anybody's phone number because we don't have to these days. But I, I still can't imagine an 18 year old woman knowing the the tow truck relatives phone number by heart. I, she's calling mom and dad and we have, we have, from the from the family statement that they were home that whole night so i again i'm just going to have to go off of the police statements to the public base and based off of what we do know and what is pointed out that that has never been brought to to light that to believe otherwise that that she never made it to that exxon station well it's so frustrating because one the cops show up they find the vehicle. They don't find her. If they do a better search, they find her right away. We're able to preserve the crime scene a little bit better. But on top of that, there's a lot of missing person cases where the the person wrecks on the side of the road, but it's kind of a desolate road. There's not a lot of people on that road. She is on a road where it's a, I would say, a pseudo busy exit. You have a hotel, you have a gas station, and especially at that time of night, you have a gas station that is open because this is 89. Not every station is going to be open 24 hours or even into the late night. So it's just so frustrating that the cops didn't find her sooner and so frustrating that there's not an eyewitness coming forward and telling us more information that somebody chances are somebody saw something and just thought maybe never followed up on it or maybe never even heard about the crime because they were traveling and passing through the area or maybe they they knew something but they were afraid but either way it's it's so frustrating that you'd think in this case there would be some eyewitness that that could really put a, a, a nail and find this bastard and, and get this guy off the streets. much more to get into and so such a frustrating case for the baker family cheers to you colonel cheers captain you're exactly right a frustrating case to the the heartbreaking and frustrating to the baker family and then frustrating to all involved and look 
again, there were some mistakes made in our opinions early on in the case. A great search was not done of that area. And not that I would expect for a great search of that area to be conducted that night when her vehicle was found, but certainly the next day. And certainly given the items that were found in her vehicle, I would have expected there to have been a better search of that area. But we can't change that, one. And two, the current day investigators are not responsible for those mistakes. They they are currently, Baker's case is very active. And again, I, I only point that out based off of recent information coming out of law enforcement, one, and two, you see the consistent and constant effort to ask the public for help. We see this as late as 2005 and then again in 2010 and 2011 and even in 2020. So there's been an effort to keep this case in the media and remind people from time to time that this case exists and that it's still unsolved. And then we went through those multiple reports that were coming out early on in this case, because I wanted everyone to understand the consistencies within those reports. Again, it seems like police are pretty locked in on the following that Amy pulled over, put on her hazards and started walking along the highway up the exit ramp. Again, We know that a witness saw her walking since we know the timing and that she made it to the top of the exit ramp. That's important. The, 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 the quote that's been made of made it to the top of the exit ramp. But here's the thing. Her body was found a mere 200 yards from her vehicle. So we're sitting here. You say frustrated captain. I agree. We're sitting here going, what the heck happened? This area was not really a pedestrian area at all, but it was a highly trafficked area. Amy is walking. So did some guy come along in a vehicle and, and, and grab her and drag her into the woods? Or, you know, as you pointed out earlier, there's still a possibility that pulls up in a vehicle and he drags her into the vehicle, rapes and kills her in his vehicle. And then, but again, I go to the idea of why, why backtrack to the area where the car was found just to get rid of the body. This is right. beyond risky. If the killer was, in fact, in a vehicle, did he pull his vehicle over and chase her into the woods? That, too, is risky, right? Because his vehicle would be sitting there on the roadside. It would have attracted some attention. And we do have... We do have the statement from police in 2005 that says police don't believe Amy knew her attacker. Rather, it was believed to have been a crime of opportunity, a stranger on stranger attack. Unless the vehicle wasn't a car and it was something like a motorcycle where he could kind of hide it behind her car. Right. That's what that's what I'm that's the thing that I can't get around in this case. If the perpetrator did have some kind of vehicle motorcycles. Very interesting to think about if he did have a vehicle, where did he leave the vehicle during the attack and during the murder? Again, it's difficult too, because we talked about this in the Nancy Eagleson case that we covered not too long ago. Tire tracks would be key, but you're not finding the body until two days later. We know that there were, would have been other vehicles that, could have contaminated that area with tire tracks. Tire tracks near the body would be of, of a bigger concern than tire tracks near where her car was found. The other thing too, did, we don't know. Did they dust her car for prints? Because we said the possibility that he could have come back and placed a purse or something in the car. Right. I, I think that's the other thing though, too, is would she get into a car with somebody she didn't know? They say most likely not, but it's like, what if she gets up to that exit? So now she's inside of the gas gas station. She feels a little more safe. Somebody pulls up and says, Hey, can I help you? No, I'm, I just ran out of gas. And the guy says, Oh, well I have a gas can and now it changes the whole game. Okay. Well, I could call somebody and bother somebody and wait, right? Wait all this time for them to get dressed and come 
you know, come find me. And they're going to have to get a gas can or something, or we're going to have to leave my car on the side of the road. You see what I'm saying? So it's like, yeah, maybe in norm- normal situations, Amy wouldn't get into a car with a stranger or get into a truck or get into a van with a stranger. But what if they're offering such a simple solution? Oh, well, I got a gas can. We can just go fill that up real quick and put some gas in your car and you'll be on your way. Or what if she didn't have a choice? What if there's yeah. a situation where she's pulled in or there's a, a gun, a knife or something that's presented, a threat level that's presented that she doesn't believe that she has a choice in the matter? Yeah, it could have been threat level midnight. So let's go to 1995. This is going to be roughly about six years after Amy's murder. This is when the Fairfax County's four-member cold case squad was formed. Amy's case was just one of many that the unit is going to be tasked with solving. Now, as of 1998, Fairfax County had 71 unsolved murder cases on the books dating as far back as 1964. Fairfax County police have a good solve rate. They are closing more than 70% of the approximately 12 murders that occur in the county annually. So a very good solve rate by Fairfax County. There are between 1,400 and 1,500 officers on the force, so a rather large force. Um, Detective Dick Klein inherited the cardboard box full of Amy Baker's murder investigation evidence, this in 1992, after another detective resigned. Amy's case still generates phone calls to the county's crime solvers hotline and to criminal investigators. Police continue to compare the circumstances of Amy's death with other seemingly unrelated but similar crimes around the country. Again, they're working off of, they seem to have evidence that they believe this is a stranger on stranger crime. So good by them to be looking at similar crimes, not just in their county, not just in their state, but around the country. Detective Klein's experience and the extreme violence of this crime of Amy Baker's murder has led this detective to conclude that whoever killed Amy Baker has a police record. Believe it or not, that's pretty much the end of what we know for sure about Amy's case, except for one thing, something you had asked about earlier, Captain. There is DNA in this case. So in 1999, Detective Klein told the Times-Dispatch that the autopsy on Amy turned up DNA evidence belonging to the killer. Detective Klein has had the DNA reanalyzed and run through a state database of known offenders. The work allowed Detective Klein to eliminate five names from a list of six suspects that he compiled. So this cold case detective comes up with six suspects after reviewing the evidence, after reviewing the file and working the case for a period of time, the DNA evidence that they have that was collected back in 1989 has eliminated five of those six suspects that this detective had. Repeat that again. Out of the six suspects they had, five of them have been eliminated. Yes. Detective Klein, after he worked the case, he's a cold case detective. After he had time to, to review the evidence, review the file, test some things and work the case for a period of time, he came up with what he says is six suspects. And he says that the DNA evidence that was collected back then, back in 1989 has eliminated five of those persons from his short list of six suspects. Well, wouldn't that mean they have one left? Well, there's some there's some problems. So when earlier when I gave you the answer of yes and no when it comes to right, don't we have something today that we can test that can lead us to finding this offender? Well, there's a couple of problems. And this also creates a problem for the detective's statement that he believes based off of the evidence of the crime that he thinks whoever would have killed Amy Baker would have a police record. So 
the offender's DNA is not in CODIS. So what that means is they don't have anybody on file. That doesn't mean that this guy never committed another crime. This doesn't mean that he never committed another felony. It just means that from the time that they started, that, that CODIS started collecting DNA, offender DNA, the DNA that they're looking for in the Amy Baker case is not in the CODIS database. As we just pointed out, the DNA collected at the time did not match those five other suspects. So let's get into the weeds a little bit and, and get into some better detail with this. So th- this is all based off of information that's coming from Fairfax County Police. This says DNA evidence was also collected at the scene, but at the time, the technology wasn't at the level that it is today. There's no longer enough of the sample left to conduct additional tests. So basically they've used it all up. The DNA evidence that they had, they used it all up. The only hope now is that a suspect turns up in CODIS at some point or police discover discover a suspect who is a match after a one-to-one comparison. What I'm pointing out here, Captain, is that the biological material that's left, there's there's no more biological material left, so we cannot go and do a forensic genealogy. Right, but you know, think about this. It's investigation. Guy commits this crime in 89, maybe he commits a similar crime in 90. When he's arrested for that crime, he is then put in prison but they don't take his DNA, and then he's, let's say, murdered later on that year. His information, his DNA would would have never been collected. And there's so many, obviously, possibilities of this person being arrested for another crime and them not getting his DNA. That's correct. That's, that's absolutely correct. And so... The other possibility that we have here that we should explore, and this is where we need people that know Amy Baker to come forward. This is conversations that should have been had, and maybe maybe these conversations took place, and that's why we are where we are today. So I think it's probably a, an error on my part to say that this is offender DNA, that this is suspect DNA, but we certainly see that they're using it to eliminate people, but I don't know where that DNA came from. The, the reports are that it was collected at the scene where her body was found that, you know, and without getting too, you know, I'm not going to get into to too much discussion of our victim here because we know that she was attacked. They believe that she was sexually assaulted, uh, that a rape was committed and then she was murdered. That's been their statement. So, Based off of their statements, I would suspect that to be the killer's DNA. It's the, it belongs to the the rapist and the killer, who are the same person. Is there a chance that we could have a situation where there was a consensual sexual encounter leading up to her car, be, before her car breaks down? I'm not saying you know sometime earlier that day, and this is kind of boogered up the investigation. Right, because there's a chance that she could have been abducted, assaulted, and killed, but it's not in the traditional sexual slash rape manner that we're thinking of. So, and I I bring all that messy stuff and disgusting stuff up for good reason, and that is because there is a suspect we we said that has not been cleared through. Um, sorry. And I say that because there is that sixth suspect, one who has not been cleared by DNA. So you think that that's pretty easy, right? But there's also a suspect that the police really like in this case who has been cleared by the DNA. Well, that's that's pretty interesting. So that makes the DNA very confusing here in this situation, right? And this, this suspect is Melvin Irving Shiflett. So Melvin Shiflett is a convicted murderer and he has also sexually assaulted and attempted to murder another victim. But thankfully she smacks him in the head with a bottle, damn near knocks him out and she flees the scene and is later able to testify against him. 
So the sexual assault that he conducted on these two victims, one that was murdered, one that he attempted to murder, was that he forced the victim to perform oral sex on him. He was unable to perform. He's unable to get an erection. And yet he murders the one victim and attempts to murder the other victim. And by the way, in both cases, strangulation was the method of murder and the method of attempted murder. So this is not the colonel just bringing up a suspect here. This is a suspect that is being looked at in this case by the investigators that are working this case. Yeah, you're not being all willy-nilly or sing-along ding-dong. So where we see science help in so many cases, we can also see situations where science is confusing. Stupid science. And is not so helpful. Right. But again... You would think that they would have information about Amy's personal life and details of the events of her personal life that led up to her car running out of gas before she's because the period of time that goes down between her running out of gas and the murder. Some of that's going to be based off of science, off of the coroner's findings at the autopsy. And some of that's going to be based off of eyewitnesses and who are those eyewitnesses the eyewitnesses are her family that know the time that she left their home to travel home her family that she spoke to on the phone that says i'm leaving i'm on my way home i'll be there soon and the potential witness that saw her at the top or near the top of the exit ramp you are going to include all of those in your findings and in your statement of making a time of death, which they have stated occurred within 30 to maybe 60 minutes after she left her vehicle. We should point out a couple of things before we move off of this suspect, Melvin Irving Shiflet. So while I've seen to, I've seen several reports that, that make him the sixth suspect or, an uncleared suspect. Again, the, the, the clearing of five with the DNA based off the reports I've seen doesn't clear him in this case, right? He's one of the five that the DNA doesn't match, but to say that it cleared him is difficult because it seems like he's remained on their list of suspects based off of his previous crimes, the murder that he committed, the attempted murder that he, he committed but the DNA doesn't match up. So I, I, we need to point out all angles here, especially when we're talking about a quote unquote suspect here, right? So we should note that Melvin Irving Shiflet, he did get out of prison one month before Amy was killed, but one local paper, this is the freelance star reported that Melvin Irvin Shiflet, one of the region's known killers, now serving time on rape and murder charges, was cleared after a comparison with DNA evidence taken from Amy's body. So he he remains a, a, a very confusing suspect in this case and in this on the list of suspects, and we don't have other people being named publicly. It's very frustrating and Frustrating probably for law enforcement because so much time has gone by, but even more frustrating for Amy Baker's family and friends and loved ones. And to expand on that frustration, Captain, we have a 2014 article, again from the Freelance Star, that reports Fairfax Police. This is Detective John Farrell, who is the cold case officer in charge at the at the time of 2014 in charge of Amy's case, he acknowledged publicly the frustration a case such as this brings to the family and to police. He would not speak at the time specifically about the case in particular about the condition or the availability of DNA evidence that was recovered from our victim. Um, We pretty much, we got pretty much the same thing when, we contacted the Fairfax police cold case unit 
the the email that we received back was the Amy Baker case is an active case being investigated by our cold case squad due to the case being active. I will not comment on suspect or evidence status at this time. We always welcome the documentaries so that the public knows we have not forgotten the victims and the potential that someone out there listening will come forward with new information. If you saw something, say something. Or if you've heard something, say something. This case is solvable. This case is very solvable, and it's one, Captain, that there there are some local rumors and such that that we didn't feel would be appropriate to review here um, for reasons that we cannot get into at this time. But this is a case that you may find us revisiting on off the record at some point as as clarity comes forward in some of this information that we are currently sitting on. Again, like the captain says, if you, if you saw something, say something, if you know something, that's the, I think that's the, the other thing that we need to point out here, right? A lot of time has expired between the time that Amy was killed and today. Somebody likely has told somebody something along the way something that they did back in 1989, something that they're not proud of, something that they they may even be scared of, uh, somebody that's been looking over their shoulder all of this time. So if anybody has said anything to you uh, over the years and you know something, help this family out, please. Please help this family out. Help them find some peace, right? It's been a long time, and Sue Baker and the the wonderful Baker family, they deserve to, to have some peace and to get some justice for their daughter who never made it home that night. I want to thank you so much for joining us here in the garage and thank you so much for tagging us in your stories on Instagram. We absolutely love it, and we love seeing those. Colonel, do we have any recommended reading for the beautiful listeners? You know what? This week, Captain, we are recommending a book by Christopher Barry D. titled Talking with Serial Killers, The Most Evil People in the World Tell Their Own Stories. And I blanked a couple weeks ago when we talked about the Texas monster that is Kenneth McDuff. and. I blanked because I should have recommended this book when we covered that case because there's an interview with Kenneth McDuff in here, and I use that for part of the research. There's also interviews with several other serial killers. This is the most evil people in their own words. So check out that great title. Again, it is Talking with Serial Killers by Christopher Barry D. You can find that book and other titles, including podcast, other books, maybe movies, documentaries, several recommendations all on our recommended page on our website, truecrimegarage.com. And you know they're good because they're coming from the goat. Until next week. Be good, be kind, and don't let